Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. In this video, I shall continue my series about the history of the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, this is for A-level history. So I pointed out how for most of uh, 1923, Lenin had been uh, incapacitated by strokes. And then finally, in uh, late January 1924, he had a stroke which proved fatal. So he was called to his reward uh, in the great big Soviet in the sky. Uh, it was almost immediately decided to embalm his body. This involves removing the organs because they would rot very quickly and then sewing the body back up, making it uh, presentable. They even put makeup on these bodies for a public funeral. It wasn't obviously just family and close friends. Um, so his uh, carcass was embalmed. Um, so it allowed them time to decide what they're going to do. I'm not sure they could treat it with formaldehyde in those days. They put a body in a morgue and freeze it indefinitely. And they decided that um, it would lie in state in a special building which would hastily be erected to house his mortal remains. And it was labelled the genius of geniuses by Stalin. Um, remember, it was just after Howard Carter had found Tutankhamun's tomb. And so the early 1920s, there was a craze for all things ancient Egyptian. So uh, this partly explains why they built uh, a little pyramid for um, Lenin and gave him a pharaonic uh, treatment in death. Uh, so a wooden mausoleum was put up on Red Square in the heart of Moscow, right in front of the Kremlin. The Kremlin is a is means fortress. It's a castle in the middle of Moscow, a complex of many buildings, which is this now a synodoch for the uh, Russian state. And, um, houses the president's official residence. They spend hardly any time there, a concert hall. Anyway, I shan't be distracted by that. Um, anyway, so at uh, Lenin's funeral, high-ranking communists vied to heap ever more superb uh, elegies um, on uh, the extinct Lenin. And um, they quickly decided that the body would not be just preserved for a week or so, but for all eternity. Um, and the organs themselves, well, certainly the brain, must be kept for posterity. Uh, an institute, institute of the brain was founded to keep his brain in good condition and to study it. Uh, the premise was that such an exceptionally um, erudite personage must have a brain um, that was preternatural uh, in its ability. Uh, because such was his intellectual prowess, as proven by his many published works. He published over three and a half million words. Um, it was not until one of the 1980s that a distinguished scientist, would have been a neurologist, uh, had the audacity to write that there's nothing particularly unusual about Lenin's brain. Um, this is recorded in Colonel Volkogonov's book. And indeed, when other communist luminaries were to die in subsequent decades, like Dr. Agostino Neto of, um, of Angola, they uh, had similar treatment. So um, there on the catafalque, Stalin was standing, and at the obsequies, he read uh, his tribute to the fallen Lenin. Uh, a hymn to Lenin was later composed and sung by many. Crucially, Trotsky had not been present. He'd been somewhere in the south, duck hunting. He'd caught a cold and was unable to travel because it was a train journey of a few days to get there. Plus, news traveled very fast. There weren't even many telegraph books send messages. There were army radios, there weren't many of those. Radios were enormous in those days, like the size of a fridge. So that wooden mausoleum was later rebuilt in stone, well in marble and granite, and his body has been uh, kept there with that just died look. Um, chemicals are injected under the skin to uh, give it that appearance. Um, and there's a glass screen so it can't be vandalized. People have tried to do that in the 70s. Some have speculated that the so-called corpse is in fact a wax dummy. I don't know. I filed past it. If you go in there, you'll find there's nothing in there besides him on the walls, just a couple of red flags, no inscriptions, no images, nothing to distract from uh, his uh, corpse. Uh, okay, so Lenin was dead. Remember, he was chairman of the Council of People's Commissars. That's equivalent to prime minister in most systems. But of course, they weren't used to going to use this uh, capitalist bourgeois terminology, such as prime minister. Just like a government minister was a people's commissar. So a uh, general was a, a comrade general, what was called that. So upon the uh, decease of Lenin, there were four um, 
main uh, contenders for Supremo. These were Leon Trotsky, Josef um, Stalin, Georgi Zinoviev, and Lev Kamenev. Um, it's notable that um, of those, none was an ethnic Russian. Um, three of them were Jewish and one of them was Georgian. Um, so there obviously were ethnic Russians amongst the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Indeed, most of the party was. But um, some people from certain ethnic minorities rose to the top quite a lot. Why were quite a few um, communist leaders Jewish? Partly because conservatism in Russia and most European countries was tinged with anti-Semitism. Not every conservative is an anti-Semite, but more than a few were. And it would be very difficult for Jewish people to identify with the Russian state prior to that, which had discriminated against them, which had organized pogroms in the black countries against them, and so on. Um, so um, it was a, communism was a creed that was all but unknown in Central Asia until 1917. A few Russian railway workers might have believed in it there. Um, modern political nostra in general had been unknown in Central Asia, but it was being disseminated in the early 1920s. So I talked about how um, Trotsky made this misstep in not returning to Moscow for the funeral, but I think he was seriously ill. A cold in the early 20s was uh, more worrisome than it is now. It's before antibiotics and all that. So a shower of rain had struck him ill. He was bedridden. Um, so I don't think it was an error of judgment. However, Lenin as um, poor health had been an open secret for some time. Certainly, um, the elite were in the know. It might have been wiser for uh, Trotsky to construct, contrive a reason to stay close to the capital as, um, Helen's, as Lenin's health deteriorated. Um, anyway, some misinterpreted um, Trotsky's absence as a calculated insult, but I don't think it was disrespect. Trotsky's enemies were legion, and they're very eager to portray his uh, non-attendance at uh, the um, uh, leader's funeral as being a sign of extreme discourtesy. Lenin had a more, so not Lenin, sorry, Trotsky had more than a usual ration of arrogance. So he rubbed people up the wrong way, he was very condescending, he was brainy and he knew it. And being a Johnny come lately to the Bolshevik cause, many uh, old timers uh, resented him. So there's a lot of rancor between him and the other communist leaders. No love lost. Was he a genuine Bolshevik or simply a time a server, he had he just uh, jumped on the bandwagon. But the victor's laurels of the Civil War must be laid at the door, and indeed the atrocities. Now, don't wish to impugn the honour of the Red Army, not saying all or even most Red Army soldiers were even directly involved in this sort of thing. The same would go for the Whites, but there were more than a few massacres, and indeed prisoners killed, sometimes in particularly agonising ways. And Trotsky ultimately carried the can for that. He never expressed the least remorse, regret about this. He never spared people when he could have them killed. And this is not killing people in combat, it's killing defenseless people. So he was um, a vociferous advocate of uh, mass scale terror. Um, he could be blamed for deciding the Treaty of Brest Litovsk, um, but so could Lenin. But remember, that was March 1918 when Russia formally pulled out of the First World War and had to cede what we'd now call Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Belarus, the Ukraine to um, Germany, some land of the Caucasus to the Ottoman Empire. And Trotsky had agonized about that. And during the negotiations at Brest-Litovsk, the Germans had invited him to a black tie dinner. Should I wear a black tie dinner? He sent a telegraph to Lenin because this was the uniform of the haut bourgeoisie. And Lenin said, you wear a tutu if it would help the revolution. Because uh, Lenin was completely cold-blooded. He was guided by expediency, it seemed, which was an odd contradiction for a man who was in other respects very doctrinaire and uh, completely guided by a rigid ideology. Um, so Trotsky had spent many years outside Russia and to that extent was much more cosmopolitan than many of his confrères. I mean, uh, I know some of them have been in exile, but he even, even been in New York for some time and traveled back via Canada um, after the February Revolution of 1917. And that's why uh, he had uh, several languages under his belt. Um, he spoke uh, Good English, in a sense, grammatically, with a broad lexis, but with an appalling accent. Um, so uh, he had some bourgeois cosmopolitan tastes. So uh, there was spite as a reason to dislike him, but there were some good policy-based reasons uh, to oppose the advent of uh, Trotsky to pole position. 
Trotsky was a red warrior, hell-bent on liberating the rest of the world as he would see it. The working class across the world was groaning under uh, vicious capitalist exploitation um, and pleading with uh, the Red Legions to liberate them. So Lenin believed, sorry, Trotsky believed the best form of defense was attack. The imperialists had tried again and again to um, annihilate communism, but mustn't allow them to build up the reserves and smash communism to smithereens at a propitious moment. No, communism must seize the initiative and uh, um, wipe out capitalism, free the oppressed. Um, global revolution must be launched immediately. Trotsky's opponents were less starry-eyed, and they thought he was totally unrealistic. Um, Russia, or well, the Soviet Union, was licking her wounds, having to rebuild buildings, railway lines, gather her strength, reopen factories, things like that. The public had no appetite for another war. Millions of people have been killed um, from 1914 to 22, and I mean millions. Um, millions more had starved to death. There were many men who were maimed from war. There were many orphans. So the country was in absolutely no fit state to fight. And the Soviet Union had reached a modus vivendi with um, the capitalist countries. So as long as we don't bother them, they won't bother us. No more intervention. So we need to consolidate, not to start another war. These um, Red Army soi-disant liberators had met short shrift in Poland. Uh, the proletariat in other countries largely did not embrace the Red Army. So the world situation had settled down, the world economy was picking up. In fact, workers were less discontent than before. So if the moment had been right for revolution, it would have been right after the First World War, not 1924. The old order had regained its strength and got its grip back. Um, it reformed sufficiently to maintain its grasp on power. And it wasn't necessarily conservatism, liberalism to some extent. Parliamentary socialist parties had uh, got into government. Germany had um, proved that there was a complete fissure between um, the democratic left and the communists. So they couldn't expect a broad left to help. So the time was not right for revolution at all, and the USSR was very feeble after so many years of destruction. Um, so the USSR had a more or less civil relationship with France, the United Kingdom, the USA, other countries. So she was re-establishing diplomatic relations with countries. You shouldn't, shouldn't sever all that. Don't wreck what patient dipl diplomacy had finally constructed for the sake of this impossible and feverish fantasy um, of a global revolution, which was sure to lead to utter catastrophe and the extirpation of the communist idyll.